please welcome Ethereum founder Vitalik Buterin for a special Q&A on Ethereum 2.0, moderated by Ejaz Ahmadeen, lead token architect of digital assets at Consensus. All right. Uh, this is new. Uh, hello from the dystopian future. Um, thank you all for turning up on an early and lovely morning uh, here in Tel Aviv. Uh, I'm going to kick things off straight away. Um, Vitalik, what have you been up to over the last couple of months? What's been keeping you busy? A lot of things. In, over the last couple of months, uh, in the Ethereum one, uh, 2 phase zero spec has been uh, getting clo uh, finalized. So right now it's in the stage that basically says final except for security audits. And like, there have been security audits happening. There's this uh, wonderful uh, Japanese formal verification team that's been uh, looking over the Casper FFG uh, fork choice rule, and they've been uh, posting some uh, suggestions for how to fi how to fix some issues on ETH research, and that's been uh, really great. Um, there's um, and the interoperability workshop that I unfortunately uh, could not be at because I was um, all the way on the other side of the world from that here in Israel. And uh, basically there were just seven uh, Ethereum 2.0 implementations that everyone got together in a room and they managed to get all their clients and sync and talk to each other. And that's so, so just a quick point on that. Mm -hmm. um, I think a common sort of observation is there's quite a few groups working on different clients and things within mm -hmm. um, the Ethereum community. How is all of that kind of being coordinated in a sense? Uh, is this all kind of like a weird mishmash of events or are you guys a lot more organized than perceived? There's uh, d definitely an um, organization happening. I mean, like Danny Ryan, our core researcher, has been doing a really good job on uh, just talking to all of these teams, answering their questions, and uh, helping to make sure that they're all on the same page. And they end up collaborating independently quite a bit. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so obviously, this whole transition is going to kick off with what we're calling phase zero. Um, what are the updates on that? Where, what's the state of affairs currently? Yeah, and it's basically the spec is finalized with, um, e except for things that come up during the, these uh, security audits. And um, the clients are now talking to each other. The next step is basically to make sure that they can maintain a public network at scale. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that I think the uh, client developers are starting to focus on now. Mm -hmm. And... There's definitely enough difficult parts to it because we're talking about potentially hundreds of thousands of validators that are aggregating a huge number of these uh, BLS signatures once every few minutes. Mm -hmm. And doing this involves like aggregating some messages on subnetworks, publishing them to another subnetwork, putting them together into a block. And like this complexity is going to be necessary anyway for sharding because like the unique thing about sharding is that there is too much data to kind of broadcast all of it in a single peer to peer network yep. where everyone downloads it but it's it is something that we're starting well we've already started to work to work on for quite a while we're continuing to work on and I mean it's been really interesting though this is uh things that uh, the developers have been uh, working on more than myself. Uh -huh. you know, for my own side, I also am focusing on phase one and phase two quite a bit. That's great. So I think I've hit more of the general icebreaker questions that I wanted to do, but mm -hmm. I wanted to make this session different and dig into a few things which I feel are still a point of contention and are being asked within the community quite a bit. Ooh, I love so, contention. All right, let's go. Uh, let's start off uh, softly. So validator rewards. Mm -hmm. Right now, there's been a few economic models that have been pushed out by a few groups, mm -hmm. which have sort of estimated the kind of incentive award for developers, at least, or validators that um, participate on ETH 2.0 to be at a quite a low percentage. Can you talk us through some of the economics as it stands and the distribution <coughs> over time? Yeah, so there's been a lot of misconceptions there. So like, for example, there's people throwing around the uh, like one uh, percent statistic and in reality right the the maximum reward is 1.7 percent per year only in the case where like pretty much literally everyone is staking um, and so in the case where a smaller number of validators is staking the the return the rewards go up quite a bit right so like for example 
if you go down from 100 million ETH to 10 million ETH, then we're talking about dropping from 1.7% to around five, like something like 5.5%, okay. go down to 1 million ETH, it goes up to 17%. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, there, there's like some fraction of fees that you would get. And so all to get, like, it's, it's going to hit an equilibrium. Okay. And like it's i guess it's important to kind of keep in mind that like the goal of proof of stake is ultimately to kind of minimize the costs of uh r keeping the blockchain in consensus and so no we're not going to like have numbers that are just a kind of a giveaway to anyone who is willing to lock, to, willing to lock the wreath up in a um, in a box for a few weeks sure. okay. yeah so like, like we think that the chain uh, We'll totally have enough security if 10 million ETH is validating, and like if 90% of people think that validating is not worth it, then that's still 10 million ETH validating. So, okay, it, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, a point on DApps. Mm -hmm. So if I'm running a DApp on ETH 1.x mm -hmm. and I'm transitioning this onto 2.0, how exactly does that look? Sure. So this is something that's still kind of in the process of being worked on, but. The basic idea is that so ETH 2.0 phases 0, 1, and 2 will launch, and you'll be able to start doing things on your own on the ETH 2 side from scratch, you, except you can kind of move your ETH over onto the ETH 2 side. But then eventually there would come a point where we, we would want to basically migrate ETH 1, the ETH 1 system over onto ETH 2. And I mean, one to two years ago, the thinking was just like, oh, we'll kind of let the ETH1 side just kind of die off on its own and everyone will move over. But we figured out an approach that's kind of much more friendly to kind of preserving existing applications, which is basically to say at, at some point we'll take the state route from the ETH1 side and we'll just do a hard fork on the ETH2 side that takes that state route, moves it over onto the ETH2 side creates an account, pre-mines it with uh, as much ETH as there is on the ETH1 side. And from there, it's like, all of the applications will be able to continue running, but uh, like, basically by being executed by this program on the ETH2 side that okay. is continues, basically continues to interpret and process blocks. Cool, that makes sense. Um, a core feature or a core expectation from ETH2.0 is that we're gonna achieve um, you know, significant scalability um, mm -hmm. you know, modifications from mm -hmm. this. Um, how do you think this is going to affect second layer scanning solutions? Are they going to be left out for dead or <coughs> integrated somehow? How's yeah. that running out in your head? Second layer scaling solutions are an interesting uh, topic. I and mean, I um, wrote that in a slightly controversial blog post a couple of weeks ago where I basically said that layer two protocols that have data off chain are just fundamentally going to have a hard time generalizing um, and like there's some economic reasoning behind that and once you understand it like you would realize why it's just hard to make to, to go from like channels and lightning and plasma for payments to channels and payment and, and lightning and plasma for evm contracts and the kind of layer two that i advocated for is these layer twos that have data off chain but computation um, on chain and that with this kind of layer two, it's much easier to re get full generality back, but at the same time still get these very huge uh, scaling gains. And if you do this, then you know, you'd basically have this kind of in interesting equilibrium that's uh, halfway in between being a layer one application with all the benefits and costs and having a layer two application with the, uh, the costs and benefits of that. Um, and I think when the base chain becomes more sharded, like, yeah, there will be less need for like fully off-chain layer two things. I think there will still be value for layer two things uh, because they do provide gen genuine efficiency. And even things like repeated payments, for example. Do you, so do you think they're gonna serve specific niche, I guess, components of say a DAP, for example? Like, mm -hmm. I know, like for example, um, you've mm -hmm. got Axie Infinity that has, uh, mm -hmm. I think it's the participant layer of, mm -hmm. uh, of their game, which only runs on Loom right now. Um, yeah, I could definitely see him being more niche, okay. and I could give some examples of niches. Um, one niche that I think people really underrate is uh, light client server markets. And like basically, you know, 
you know, people talk about, like, we, we need full nodes to be incentivized so more people run full nodes. Yeah. But like, the incentives can't come from the protocol because if the incentives come from the protocol, there's just too many ways to cheat. Like, you could run a full node without actually providing anything. And, like, what are you uh, helping? But you'd still get the rewards. But well, the right way to do this is basically you have uh, uh, you create a market where clients that want data, so that want Merkle branches, receipts, state entries, whatever, on shards that they haven't already downloaded, can talk to um, server nodes, so nodes that already have that data, and basically get Merkle branches and verify them. And we have a market where basically clients connect to servers through payments channels, and the reason why payment channels are good is because like clients are going to make a series of many requests to the same server, and you get a lot of efficiencies out of that, and then this creates an incentive for servers to actually exist and be providing this uh, data to like clients. Awesome, that makes sense. Uh, I'm going to break up the technical intensity now mm -hmm. um, with, aside from Ethereum, mm -hmm. what's your favorite blockchain? Ooh, it's a fun one. And I always like Zcash, and I think the uh, community is very strong technically, and they've mm -hmm. got these uh, strong values around uh, things like preserving privacy. Mm -hmm. um, I um, I like. Let's see, what are some uh, and there's like in Cosmos, I think is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, what specifically? And they just seem to have kind of done a good job of kind of building like Tendermint and getting it to the point where lots of people are happy using it. I think uh, that's cool. Okay. Yeah. I think that's good. Mm. Um, so I recently attended quite a few of the ETH Global hackathons, mm -hmm. and there was definitely a surge of popularity around DAO-based submissions. And I feel like this is the trend of 2019 so far. Um, there's always I a mean, DAO To be goal. fair, the trend of 2019 is really putting like $100 million into DeFi contracts that may or may <laughs> not have hidden back doors. But right. You can't like, read my questions <laughs> way in advance. Okay. Okay. Um, so... <laughs> On the DAO side of things, how do you see that panning out in the Ethereum community and the Ethereum development? How relevant do we do we think or do you feel this is going to be, particularly from mm -hmm. the governance specific mm -hmm. standpoint? So I know everyone talks about Moloch mm -hmm. and Maker and Aragon mm -hmm. stuff. Like, mm -hmm. tell me where your head's up. Yeah, so I guess like spiritually, I really love DAOs um, because I think uh, like creating new and better ways for people to coordinate and to cooperate on uh, projects, whether it's uh, a company, whether it's uh, launching a new crypto project, whether it's some no a non-profit and charity thing, um, running par uh, eventually parts of some kind of political system on top of it. Like I think imp like coming up with alternatives to basically existing like nonprofits and states and corporations is something that's definitely close to my heart. And it's, uh, I'm definitely in, like, excited about this, the idea that with Ethereum we can create this platform that makes it easier to um, experiment with these kinds of things. Um, at the same time, and there's definitely kind of shortcomings of a lot of the existing constructions. So probably the biggest one that I kind of yell at people about the most is this uh, collusion and bribing issue. Yep. So basically, you know, you have a DAO and if you have coins you can vote. And there's like economic arguments why the whole concept of coin voting and shareholder vo voting is kind of stupid and plutocratic anyway. <laughs> but um, the um, even kind of going past that, like, basically the problem is that you can create a smart contract that just says, if you vote for this thing, then I will give you money. Yeah, dark DAOs. Yeah, dark DAOs. Phil Dian wrote some blog posts about this. Um, sellout DAO, this um, like actual implementation of a dark DAO for Moloch is, uh, exists now. Um, and if you do this, the problem is basically that good governance of like any public resource is a public good. And so any individual can only capture a small portion of the benefits from a good decision that they make, but they capture the full benefits from accepting a bribe that goes to the targeted to them. And so if everyone does this, then like, the entire DAO could just veer off in a direction that none of the participants wanted it to. Have you seen any recent examples of DAO implementations that you think are actually on track? So... There's two ways to solve this problem, right? One is to assume that it's not going to happen, and for, um, a lot of the, most of the time, until it happens, and it could happen, and when it happens, you should be able to exit. 
And Moloch uh, made a really good decision of adding this rage quit mechanism so that like, you can exit and take your money out. But like exit alone is, def is ultimately limiting, right? Like we need voice and exit and voice to organize collective exits and exits from voice mechanisms. And so the other approach is to actually like hunker down and build DAO designs that are more resistant to collusion. And uh, I wrote this post on ETH research about how you can use a combination of like, ZK snarks and some other cryptography to actually implement that kind of thing. And, and Barry's uh, team has been uh, doing so, some uh, good work on actually building it. And I definitely uh, really want uh, that kind of technology to actually get tried and used as soon as it's ready. So on that topic then, mm -hmm. um, we're in Israel, mm -hmm. um, home to some very dedicated and driven driven uh, privacy efforts um, mm -hmm. in the Ethereum community or the blockchain community as a whole. Um, where are we at in terms of privacy, right? So we're in the home of like Starkware and a bunch of different um, other teams. Mm -hmm. um, tell me how that's progressed so far. So ZK Snarks in general have really made a huge kind of leap of progress just over the last three weeks yeah. in a way that a lot of people aren't realizing. Right, so you have Plonk, this uh, ZK Snark protocol with a single universal updatable trusted setup, which basically means you have only one uh, trusted setup that you run it once and it works for every program. You don't need to do a new trusted setup for every new program. And also the setup is updatable, which means if you have an existing setup, you can join it and you can make a new setup, which is secure if either the original one was secure or you're secure. And what this means is that it's really easy for thousands of people to participate. Okay. Um, and so Plonk uh, basically is a CK Stark protocol that has only this very minimal trusted setup requirement. Um, also, there were some announcements recently about um, what's called polynomial commitment mm -hmm. protocols that have like really reduced security assumptions. And the other interesting thing that's happening inside of Plonk is that they've basically achieved this kind of layer separation where you have you break up a snark into two parts, where one of them is um, arithmetization, so basically converting a, um, pro a a computer program satisfaction problem, so like give me an input that gives this output, into a series of structured math equations. And then a polynomial commitment scheme basically is a scheme that lets you kind of encapsulate a huge number of values into a single value in such a way that you can still kind of make improved mathematical claims about them. Mm -hmm. And these two things, you can kind of innovate on them separately, right? And you can kind of mix and match, right? You can take Plunk, cut out the, their trusted setup, add in another trusted setup, add in Fry, add in like what uh, this new in an order group based thing, whatever, whatever. And so basically, it's kind of like mix and match. You know, you choose the trusted setup based on like basically your political ideology. Like, are you afraid of discrete logs? Are you afraid of trusted setups? Are you afraid of hashes? So, in your and... opinion, are all of these different setups <laughs> solving for the main problem, which yeah. is my zk snark or stock or whatever it might be takes too damn long to compute it's uh, I mean, too damn long is a problem that this is not solving what it's solving is this kind of fragmentation in the space where you have yeah. these different schemes with like very different trade-offs mm. and so here it's much simpler you just choose like are you happy with with more cryptographic assumptions in exchange for more cryptographic assumptions you get sh uh, you get shorter proofs and second, like arithmetization, which is just something that people can kind of quietly work and optimize over time. Okay. So it's like it's not the sort of thing that you'll see the benefits of immediately, but in terms of what this will do to just like developer tooling for the space over the next two years, it's huge. Amazing. Um, I want to touch upon the elephant in the room, mm -hmm. which is DeFi. Mm. Um, this has been a hot and trending topic. I love for... elephants, and uh, we're in a room, so this is great. <laughs> um, we planned that prop, by the way. Um, no, we didn't. Uh, so on uh, on DeFi, this has been a hot topic that's been spoken about quite a lot in the last six months. Um, mm. There's been a few protocols which I'm happy to happy to mention, like Compound, mm -hmm. UIDX, and a bunch of others that have been spoken about. And I feel like there's a lot of reliance being placed on these protocols. Mm -hmm. Not good, not bad. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on how that all stacks up? Yeah, so I guess like I'll start by saying that I'm like very excited about the potential that um, DeFi uh, offers in principle. So the idea that just anyone anywhere in the world can just 
have access to a system that lets them pay each other and lets them ex and lets them you know, basically choose their own financial exposure is a, a really powerful thing. That's something a lot of people just don't have access to, and they're just stuck like holding some depreciating currency with no way to save in anything else. And kind of moving away from that is great. Um, also, another example of a, a kind of DeFi-ish thing that I really love is um, there's this uh, idea that got published on his research a few weeks ago called uh, Public Interest Projects. And what this is, is it's kind of like a spin on the DAICO idea that I had um, uh, one and a half years ago. So the idea basically is that instead of projects having ICOs where people just uh, send them the money and then they um, uh, go away, um, you have a scheme where people uh, put uh, their tokens into a smart contract. And uh, they, let's say you would put your DAI into a smart contract. The developers don't just have access to the DAI and they can't take and run it. Instead, what happens is the DAI gets put into Compound or some other interesting thing. Maybe like you'll have DAI with, a, with its own native DAI savings rate thing soon and that'll be great. Um, and then the interest goes to the developers. So you're just kind of parking your money into a contract. That you choose which project it goes to. This could be non-profit or for-profit. Yeah. So this is yeah. like this is like what Staked just released, right? Which is their Robo Advisor mm -hmm. Yield thingy way, and it's all it is is essentially you deposit a particular asset. All all it is is you deposit a particular asset, mm -hmm. and smart contracts essentially figure out which is the best. No, it's not about that. it's not about maximizing returns for yourself. It's mm. about basically taking the returns and automatically just directly pumping the yeah. returns into a project that you want to support. Right. And the reason I love this is because it basically means that like first of all just because of kind of default pressure like people like people have the right to take their coins out at any time but mm. they're not going to unless they think that something really bad is happening. Yeah. Like projects do have some stability of funding, mm. but at the same time if a project becomes sketchy, the CEO disappears and goes off to Indonesia or like whatever, whatever, <laughs> then um, this, there's not like this existing pile of money that they could just run off with, right? Like they have incentives to continue building, continue doing good work, so they keep getting the money. And so this, yeah. like, this could really mitigate a lot of the okay. kind of concerns with fraud that we've been having in the in the ICO space. And okay. like once again, like mechanism designed to improve human organization and allow these kind of more decentralized trust minimized alternatives is something I like really care about and love. But so now talking about problems. Yeah, so I wanna <laughs> I wanna pick upon Mm -hmm. uh, just because I want to use an example, mm -hmm. uh, Compound. So you've yeah. got Coinbase that mm -hmm. has chucked in a mail recently. You've got Dharma, who have now going to be essentially using Compound's protocol to an extent. There's a lot of focus being placed on them. Mm -hmm. um, I know a million and one co code audits have been quoted and, mm -hmm. and said there's a lot of pressure being put mm -hmm. on this self-executing code, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Now, people are comparing DeFi already to traditional financial mm -hmm. ecosystems and applications and saying, or even comparing and saying that it's of a higher degree or equal performance. Mm -hmm. I have an issue with that. Yeah, so, like the people like making those advertisements saying like, hey, look, you can shove your money into uh, um, Federal Reserve bonds and get 1.5 percent, or you can get get money, shove your money into my fancy schmancy cybercoin thing and get 9.5 percent. My fancy schmancy cybercoin thing is obviously better. Like, there's definitely a lot that's irresponsible about that, yeah. like, because uh, ultimately, like, there's a reason why these two things haven't equilibrated, right? Like, there's a reason why people haven't already just shoved all their money into them. And I mean, I made this kind of public uh, tw start. Twitter conversation about this a couple of weeks ago where I just said like, hey guys, Federal Reserve uh, bonds get you 1.5%, so like Compound gets you 11.5%, what the hell? And like, they, yeah, like why isn't, why aren't markets equilibrating? And the re be, a big part of the reason just is that these systems are new, they are untested, they do have a non-zero chance of uh, breaking, and we definitely at the present stage should not be encouraging people to kind of move their money into these things as, a, as safe investments. And what's have basically, well, like the problem, uh, in the problems, right? Like one is that there's risks of contract bugs. Now, they, and MakerDAO and Compound like have been 
both audited. I think MakerDAO has been formally verified. And so, I mean, I'm definitely kind of more calm about that before uh, or than I was before, um, which uh, makes me happy. And like, I hope that we continue seeing more audits, more formal verification tools, more kind of secure standard components. But then there are other failure points. So one of those failure points is just explicit centralized backdoors. Another failure mode, failure mode is um, the Oracle mechanism. Like all these DeFi things in the world are not, the de decentralization is not gonna do you much if the Oracle is controlled by one guy and the one guy can just like set it to whatever value they want to just cause people to, to liquidate and then front run um, all of the um, li uh, liquidation like uh, yabs or whatever MakerDAO calls it. <laughs> um, and uh, the, and steal a bunch of money that way, right? Like, for a system that's holding hundreds of millions of dollars, you need to be making serious moves toward making a kind of multi-party oracle scheme that is like, credibly decentralized and trustable. And like, these are good people, and they're make they're. I definitely know that they're making like, like strong steps toward this. Yeah, the intention's but, good. Yeah, and they, like, and and there is a like, good progress happening, but it is something that the community needs to kind of continue staying on the watch for and, and continuing to be kind of basically uh, very vigilant about. Like, uh, like, the price of not having another DAO hack is eternal vigilance. Understood. Mm -hmm. um, I reckon I've got about 15 more seconds on the clock. 55-0. Uh, 55-0, there you go. Thanks for the specificity there. <laughs> no, um, so I want to uh, put forward a question which was submitted, which I thought was really weird and wonderful. and. Uh, Mm -hmm. I don't know, I just want to make things more interesting. Um, so, I know you played a lot of World of Warcraft as a kid mm. um, growing up, and I know that a story that you've mentioned quite a bit in the past is uh, <laughs> one of the core defining moments that got you to realize that centralization may not be the best thing inevitably for the rest of the world um, was when the game updated and uh, a few of your characters had um, some traits that were mm. that were swapped and, and henceforth the legend says that Vitalik never played World of Warcraft again. Well, Blizzard just announced that um, they're bringing back and relaunching World of Warcraft or WoW Classic. Uh, so my question is, are you going to re-roll your characters mm. and maybe make ETH a second priority for a bit? Uh, um, I mean, if like World of Warcraft moves onto Ethereum, I'll consider it. Do they want to? You heard it here, folks. Um, <laughs> anyone from Blizzard? No, okay, maybe not. Um, well, thank you, Vitalik. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you, everyone, for your time. Can we please have a round of applause.